Radar Update. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. We've been looking at a lot of events coming together right now with the shadow patterns, the feasts, the celestial events drawing us to this time, the current events drawing us to this time, other prophetic events drawing us to this time, the enemy action going on this time, and also different signs of Shiloh and how it seems to be coming to a conclusion in this time too as well. And we see the days ahead of us are filled with some very important shadow patterns on the last appointed shadow pattern for this year. So we have great expectation right now that the gathering of Shiloh's people will happen very soon in the days ahead. Now definitely download our timeline for reference. The link is in the description box. It's on our website, informedchristians.com. We have other resources in the description box too, links to things we talk about. So definitely check them out, print them out, refer to them, and study them. There are a lot of shadow patterns from scripture that are coming together right now. We've been reminded of our Redeemer and our Bridegroom and how he has prepared a place for us and the amazing pictures woven throughout scripture about tabernacling and how God became flesh in Jesus Christ and came as a lamb, how God provided himself as a lamb to be our Redeemer and how he purchased and redeemed and ransomed us. And one day he's coming to pick up the purchased possession to eternally tabernacle with him. And so we see a lot of these pictures that we've been studying over the past few months coming together. And we've been studying it and trying to get a good understanding of it. And our expectation is high during this time. We've looked at how this feast has two important convocations, two important assemblies on the first day and on the eighth day. And they're both Sabbath days. They were both considered not work days. And so we've been taking that into consideration too with our understanding and in connection with the last half of Matthew 24 where Christ was telling his disciples what they really need to be worried about and how Christ's disciples, us, his servants, we need to be watching for the Lord's return. This is a command. It's not optional. We are told to watch for the return of our Lord. And he plainly tells us we will not know exactly the day or an hour that he comes back in. But he does seem to intimate in verse 40 and 41 that it will possibly be a working day. Now we can't say 100% though that this could not refer to the Gentiles as well. And we also have to keep in mind that the Feast of Tabernacles, the gathering, takes place there in Jerusalem for the Israelites. The whole purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles is to remind the Israelites about what God did for them during Exodus. And it applied to the strangers who were with them in their cities, so in their land. So it's, it's a very localized feast and appointment just for them. It does us good to rehearse the shadow patterns too as well. But we also have to keep in mind too that the timing with the different time zones and all that, the Feast of Tabernacles is going to start in Jerusalem at sundown. But for someone on the other side of the world, the Feast of Tabernacles for them, if they are going to commemorate it, respectively fall out in their day. So we can't say 100% that it won't happen on the Jerusalem Sabbath, but we can't also say that it's not referring to somewhere in the Gentile world either. So we just have to keep that in mind, but it does seem to intimate that it'll be during a working day from a Israelite perspective that the disciples would have been familiar with, which could also apply to the second day after the first day too as well. But we also know that the Feast of Tabernacles appears to be the only shadow pattern that's still going to be rehearsed and is still going to be applied in the future. So we know that it has a future fulfillment and on different levels too as well, applying apparently to the tribulation and also concurrent bridegroom chamber, but then also in connection with the eighth day, also being a picture of the millennial reign and then a picture after that of eternity when God is eternally tabernacling with us. So that we know there are multiple levels of the fulfillment. So we keep in mind that a good portion of the Feast of Tabernacles is still in the future. So we have an expectation that our understanding of the gathering of Shiloh's people and the rapture and how that takes place even before the tribulation starts, that will take place before this picture is engaged. Now when we look at just the sequence of events for the days ahead, there are some things we need to keep in mind. So far, we have been studying all the pictures and events coming together. This is our expectation. This is what we know. We have the expectation. We are told to watch. And so based on our best understanding, this is what we are looking at. And this is our expectation that the gathering of Shiloh's people will happen in the hours and maybe even the days ahead. But we also hedge that with knowing with our limited understanding, there are unknowns. There are aspects we do not know. We cannot say 100% that he won't come on the first day or at the end of the first day or after it either. 
we try to get an understanding of the pictures and hints that he has given us. And so that gives us an expectation to this time. So just pad your expectations that we know our watching and our understanding of the shadow patterns and everything has brought us to this time. But we will watch knowing that there are some things we do not know. But because there are unknowns and we cannot say 100% that he will not come on a Sabbath or at the end of the Sabbath or anything like that, I would highly suggest just keep your expectations in check. Be sober. Don't let your emotions get the best of you. Just keep your expectations in check. We do not know the day or hour. So I would continue to watch through the 17th, through the duration of the first day. Because the first day is the first day of the gathering, the first day of the assembly. So you could make an argument there, you know, there's room for that, that the gathering could happen on the first day, which would be sunset in Jerusalem on September 16th through the following sunset on their 17th of September as well. So just keep this in mind that because we know there are some things we do not know, we will continue to watch for the duration of the first day at least. We also know on our timeline, just from our understanding of the celestial events, that Jupiter is approximately leaving the feet at this time. And we hedge that with the word approximately on our timeline because we do not definitely know for sure the shape. And we definitely know, and I've showed before, you can rotate and shift it around a little bit. There's definitely a lot of wiggle room right there. But as we've shown before, around September 16th, is where you start stretching our understanding of the lion and where it's at constrained by the Babylonian stars that we know. But we do know around September 16th, around here somewhere, that it is going to be leaving somewhere around this time. And by the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, it's really, really going to be a stretch, especially by the 27th, which is going to be two days after the end. So we know we're in a very fuzzy zone. We know there are things we do not know. We cannot make a prediction. We cannot point to a single day. We can just say this is our strong high expectation in this area. Now some people have brought up the question of John 7, 8. Where Jesus is talking to his brethren. He says, Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast. Not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And so some people have had the question, Does this apply to the Feast of Tabernacles where we are right now? Should we expect and look for Christ to appear to be revealed in the middle of the feast? That is an interesting thought. You know, we can't say 100% no. But I would point out that this passage makes it clear that Christ was there at the Feast of Tabernacles from the very first day. The Feast of Tabernacles does not necessarily take place at the temple. It takes place in Jerusalem. And so Christ was there fulfilling the Feast of Tabernacles from the very first day. He told his brothers, I'll go on ahead. But the Bible does mention in verse 10 that he also went up to the feast. He traveled up to Jerusalem and went there for the feast too as well. He was at the feast. He was there fulfilling it, but as it were in secret. And this is the only instance of him doing it this way, particularly at the end when he is getting close to other fulfillments. But another way that you could look at the same passage is that it may point to that the gathering of Shiloh's people will happen in the first half of Tabernacles instead of the last half when he reveals himself to his people, the Jewish people, the Hebrews. One can make an argument that because the church was a mystery to the Jews, they, they didn't understand it. It was a mystery until it was actually happening, Pentecost and all that, that one could make an argument that Christ will come for his bride during the first half. He's coming for the church during the first half, which is the secret part. We should expect maybe the gathering on the first assembly, and then he's coming for his covenant people at the last assembly. It's just another interesting perspective that we could have on this same passage. When we consider the feast and the shadow patterns that happen in the beginning of the year, during the springtime, those Christ fulfilled at the beginning. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, he didn't wait till the end of it or the middle of it. He fulfilled it at the beginning, even though that was also a seven-day period too as well. So we should expect Christ to fulfill it in order, in sequence. And perhaps we can view it as that there are different stages along the Feast of Tabernacles 
representing the different time periods of when each portion will be fulfilled, particularly when we consider that the eighth day represents the millennial time period and what comes after that. We definitely know that's going to be at the end, prophetically, of time, so to speak. So we could even see it as a timeline that Christ will most likely come for his bride. He will gather his people. Shiloh will gather his people during the first half. And the assembly happens in the first half at the beginning on the very first day. And then possibly return for his people to gather them at the last assembly. Which would typology wise be during the eighth day. On that assembly day. So that's just another interesting take to have on this. Now on the evening of the 16th is also going to be a full moon, what is typically known as a harvest moon too. And cultures around the world often associate this as a harvest moon. And it's not unusual for it to be yellow tinted or orange especially as it gets toward the horizon. That's just because of all the dust that's up in the air this time of year, particularly around harvest time when a lot of dust is kicked up in the air. So seeing an orangish or yellowish moon, that's not unusual. Now, this upcoming full moon is technically a penumbral eclipse, but you won't be able to see it. It's more of a technicality. So we have great expectation where we are right now and also for the hours ahead. And I would highly suggest that you watch and pad your expectations up through the 17th. We'll be watching the days leading up to this first assembly and also watching during the duration of this first assembly day too as well. If you haven't yet, definitely download our Be Ye Ready guide. And even if you have, this is a good time to review it. Look over the instructions that Christ gave us, reminders of what we need to keep in mind as we look forward to His coming. And definitely review the Purify and Sanctify sheets so we are ready when He appears. Let Him find us shining bright, serving Him first and highest above all else. Maranatha. Maranatha.